Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, international seminar organized by the Nature for Health, Green Destination, Province of North Brabant and the Van Gogh National Park. And I'm not going to mention all the partners and uh, friends who helped to organize this wonderful seminar. Uh, I'm André van der Zande, I'm Vice President of Nature for Health Foundation. And I have a background uh, both in uh, nature conservation with the Ministry of Agriculture and Nature years. In my last 10 years, I was Director General of RAVM, the Public Health Institute of the Netherlands. So my whole life was on the bridge between nature conservation and health. So I, I really welcome you all. Uh, we're looking forward to a very interesting program. And um, I think the, the idea of this seminar is to explain, exchange experiences in this very fascinating uh, top, pop, topic, bridging two worlds, bridging complexity and um, building networks and building partnerships. I think this is uh, what we hope to achieve and we have to strengthen our insights and our bonds. So welcome to you all. We have a very interesting program. I think the first block is a couple of, I think, very interesting keynote speeches. And then we have two interesting case studies, examples, best practices. And uh, I'm looking forward to the speeches and to the examples. And after that, we'll have a break. So let us please start first with uh, Madame Magalone de Jean Pont which is the Executive Secretary of the European Landscape Convention. And uh, I think this is a very important post to hear from her what she has to say in her 10 minutes for this afternoon. So please, Mrs. Lujan Pont, you have the floor. Yes, I don't know if you can uh, tell me. Okay. I try to connect. We hear you. <laughs> you, you, but uh, you don't no. see me, no? I, I don't I don't know what happened. I am sorry. I apologize. Ah yes, one minute. I, I think it will. Oh, come. Okay, there yes. you are. <laughs> yes, I am here, and I am very pleased to be with you because the title of your meeting is uh, outstanding. I I think and make me dreaming and make uh, everybody dreaming, and congratulations to the all uh, the organizers. And I am pleased also to meet again, uh, Mr. Uh, Walter of uh, Walters, because we meet. We know since uh, so many years, and uh, in '95, uh, the Council of Europe uh, launched uh, uh, ecological networks uh, with uh, corridors uh, uh, across all uh, Europe at pan European level. And this was a starting point of all these uh, activities, you know, now uh, at, uh, in Europe, but also in other countries. And uh, we uh, personally, I work now more for the European Landscape Convention is uh, why the title of your uh, seminar is uh, so interesting for me. And uh, I, I work for a convention which name is the European Landscape Convention. It was uh, adopted in 2000. And uh, this convention, in fact, is not dealing with uh, for only uh, outstanding uh, destinations, I can say, because the idea is to put nature everywhere, not only in uh, uh, what you, we know usually uh, uh, important uh, national parks or regional parks, but also in our daily life. And this, I think, can be a very interesting dimension also of your uh, activity, uh, because uh, when uh, people uh, and uh, sometimes health, but it can be also in prevention, um, consider nature. It's uh, very uh, interesting to have a, a nature of proximity, I can say. And this uh, is very important. And uh, the dimension you are trying to, and you are, because it's your, <laughs> uh, to develop with uh, health, uh, it's uh, fundamental, it's basic, because we consider that the landscape is important for uh, health, physical health, and also for mind. And it's, these two dimensions are crucial. And uh, we must put uh, nature and uh, green uh, uh, in uh, territories. Uh, it's very important. And uh, I saw that you are uh, taking care also of people with uh, uh, health problems. And 
uh, really therapeutic uh, landscape, and I am totally convinced that uh, uh, the effects of landscape are uh, uh, impressive. And uh, I saw also that in some um, hospitals they treat uh, some people with uh, just uh, showing also uh, some uh, uh, videos and vision of nature, but of course nothing can substitute the immersion <laughs> in the landscape itself, because it's not only the view, it's all the senses of human being. And uh, the Landscape Convention considers that uh, landscape is a uh, uh, the landscape perceived by the view, but also for the other senses of human being. And this is not only my uh, opinion, it's opinion uh, written by the Committee of Ministers. And uh, this is uh, very interesting to, to pay uh, attention to this, and also to pay attention of the intellectual, as I told before, uh, mental, spiritual. I don't know what word to use, but you understand perfectly about what I am speaking. And uh, I am very interested also by the artistic dimension you, you give to your meeting with the Van Gogh uh, Park and all. It's a very um, uh, good idea to, to promote and to, 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 to uh, extend, I can say. And um, I am ready to answer some questions. Uh, I can tell you that for the moment, 40 uh, Council of Europe member states um, ratify the European Landscape Convention. And uh, it's a great idea uh, which is moving landscape because, uh, uh, of course, uh, we can um, uh, consider the environmental dimension, and landscape is part of this, but it's also with human being. And human being has uh, his part and uh, can feel the landscape. And I, I, I am sure that your meeting and your uh, uh, program will uh, be very interesting for this. And uh, I, I, I am ready to participate, to answer to some questions and to discuss with you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. I think for your very uh, embracing uh, words that you uh, welcome and hail. I think the theme of this uh, of this seminar and the relevance also for the well for the policy makers for landscape level on on at least the Europe scale. Eh? Of course, we know green destinations is working globally, but for Europe itself, it's also I think a very important message. So thank you for those kind words. Um, for, for the technicalities of the program, we have a block with exchange of views further on in the program. Um, well, if there is a very direct question now, I can uh, ask uh, Nina if there is one uh, to, to put to the front, because otherwise I, I, I would like to thank you. But Nina, is there a question on the on the chat now? No, or, no not, not yet. No, yet. Not, not, not yet. On. Okay. Yes. Okay, well then, thank you again very much uh, for your for your very inspiring speech. Uh, and let's move on to um, from Europe to the Netherlands and uh, to uh, Mr. Frank van der Eyde. He is uh, director of operations of the Van Gogh National Park and of the and the director of the Van Gogh Sites Foundation, and he has some very interesting stuff to show us. Uh, Frank, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you very much, André. Uh, and welcome in uh, Van Gogh Natural Park, because we are in a host uh, uh, area at this moment, although everyone is at home at this moment. But uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will start sharing my screen and hope everything works fine. Let's see. Okay. Is this correct? Yep. It's okay, I think. Um, well, um, I'm the director of operations of the Van Gogh National Park. Um, and also I'm director of the Van Gogh Sites Foundation. Uh, and the second organization is the organization who is involved in the heritage of Van Gogh in this area. Um, this area is a world-class economy and uh, it's also uh, covered with a beautiful natural environment. Um, later on in this uh, seminar, uh, our president, uh, Mr. Ivo Kortman, is also uh, over here and he will explain you more about this national park. Um, 
This park is uh, covered with a unique landscape uh, with brooks and rivers, um, but also uh, it's covered with Vincent's heritage. And that's why we have the name the Verwag National Park, because Vincent Verwag was uh, involved in nature. Uh, he loved nature and the landscape and the working people in this landscape. So uh, there are 39 uh, spots in this area, uh, which are all Van Gogh monuments where he lived and where he wor worked. Uh, and we like to preserve that heritage because we want to tell the story about the nature. Um, the nature in this area is right next uh, to the cities and villages. And that's quite unique because uh, when you're living in the city uh, in this area, you, um, yeah, you experience the nature just nearby. But still, uh, it's an area with a growing economy and we have some challenges, and ex especially challenges in uh, preserving nature and landscape, but also with an enormous pressure on our biodiversity. So that's why we're taking action in an area with 120,000 hectares of which nature and agricultural area. Uh, it's a big area, um, but also an area which is also covered with small cities and a lot of big villages. So to improve the connection of our inhabitants and visitors with the Acadian landscape, uh, we will invest in iconic landmarks in future. Uh, but also at this moment, we are investing in uh, biodiversity with uh, people from this area, uh, also with farmers and creating new hiking tracks. And that's all about zoning and protecting fragile, fragile areas. And especially in Corona times, these times we suffer with uh, too much people uh, uh, on spots in our nature and yeah, that's not so very good for us because we like to protect the, uh, uh, the beautiful nature. But meanwhile, we know that it's very healthy for people to go into nature. So this discussion uh, we're working with, uh, it's all about zoning uh, in our area and creating new spots and creating new areas to walk and recover. Um, in fact, we are at this moment, uh, investing in a new future for our next generations, not only about telling the story about Van Gogh, but um, meanwhile, we're just investing in creating more nature and more uh, landscapes with, uh, with a beautiful and healthy uh, exposure. And what you see here over here, uh, especially the story of uh, Vincent Van Gogh is our storyline. and. Uh, gives the opportunity to see the area through the eyes of Vincent van Gogh with innovative solutions based on the heritage of a great master. And this spot is the Vincent van Gogh uh, cycle path, just connecting the city of Eindhoven with the village of Nuenen, and also connecting two water mills in the area where Vincent van Gogh uh, walked 130 years ago when he was in this area and painted beautiful paintings and so on. Um, we're not only telling the story of Vincent, but we are using the story of Vincent van Gogh uh, to start with the story for our people to believe and let them believe that uh, the Van Gogh Nature Park starts really at the front door. Um, and that's why we like to uh, give them some inspiration and to see the, the real beauty of the common landscape just around the corner. And inspired by the works of Vincent van Gogh, you can see also in nature, the beautiful starry night, but then just like uh, this in a little river in landscape. So uh, we are investing in creating a story, but also uh, uh, in, in the community building uh, in our area. And in this way, we are investing in creating a green destination based on the storyline of becoming Vincent. Uh, and therefore, we use all kinds of techniques. And this is one example of last week, uh, like uh, just on the side of the river, the Dommel, uh, some local people uh, produced enormous puppies uh, and planted them in, in the river. Uh, 
and they take the, the children to the fields uh, to tell the story about Vincent van Gogh and van Gogh National Park. So that's very nice. Um, we have some spots in our area, um, especially in Nune, Zundert and Etteleur. There are the heritage locations where we have small museums and we are investing in those museums to tell the story about Vincent van Gogh and where he started his career. Um, and after reinvestment, which will be ready within two years, uh, we always start in that museum with a beautiful small film. And I have a, a preview for you, the trailer of the film Becoming Vincent, which is a film from about 50 minutes. The first three minutes we will show to take you with us uh, in the story of Vincent van Gogh in our Brabant region. So thank you very much for your attention. And I have to ask if the technic from Teresa will help us in showing the film. Yes, I will. I traveled all the way to the Netherlands to find out where I belong. And to experience pure beauty, canvases that will spark of unpolished Dutch and French life. Pieces of art people will lose themselves in. I have deliberately chosen to live like a dog. I will be poor. I will be a painter. But how long can you go on if nobody appreciates your work? This is Brabant, the place where I fell in love with nature. People who know that hard work will eventually lead to success. And they're right. If you want something really much and you are willing to work hard for it, then it will succeed. They will recognize my work in time. And they will write about me when I am dead. I'll make sure of that if I live long enough. Thank you very much. I think this was very impressive, uh, Frank. And uh, thank you for presenting this to us. I th I've been around for a very long time on the National Parks Movement, but my impression is that the whole Van Gogh experience is trying to bring the National Parks to a, to a very next level. And, and I think you're bridging art with heritage, with nature, with people, and I hope with also health. Uh, healing the landscape. I think this is a very, very exciting place to be and a very fitting for this seminar today. So thank you. Thank you very much. We will hear more about Van Gogh later on, but I think this was a very beautiful start and thank you very much for that. I think that is uh, um, um, very inspirational. We are also trying to find uh, the the whole argumentation of the organizing uh, parties, why we are here together and bringing some more uh, context to the, the whole topic of this meeting. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, the both directors of uh, Green Destination and uh, the executive, as we call it, for Nature for Health, uh, Albert Salman and Rob Walters. We have been uh, around a very long time in our uh, mutual histories, and it's a pleasure for me to see uh, the, the both of you here joining a presentation on this interesting topic. So I believe Albert will be the first and then and then Rob. So each one of you five minutes and uh, please you have the floor, Albert. Thank you, Andre. Yeah. 
Is this visible? Let's see. Yeah. It takes time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be pleased to clarify the role of health and nature in the recovery of leisure and tourism. First, a few words on my own organization. Since I founded Green Isolation seven years ago, we have developed into one of the world's largest networks of sustainable tourism practitioners. We have more than 50 country representatives. We have already supported 400 destinations, and now we work with SMEs in our destinations. Our main, our main goal is to support destinations and businesses in tourism sustainability. We have a range of assessments and forecasting tools. We give trainings, run an events program and a travel website, the Good Travel Guide. We run an annual competition, an awards program and a certification program for destinations and businesses. The Quality Coast Awards are already running for 14 years for coastal destinations. The other award programs are open to any type of destination. COVID-19 has changed the perception of sustainable tourism. The social well-being of local communities is now priority number one, finally. Over-tourism is not over, but moved from city centres to enjoying nature, landscapes and even city parks. Any green area is now popular and also clean air, clean water and quietness. We need new business and hospitality initiatives to make it all work properly. And more people are aware of the downside of traveling very far for reasons of climate. It means we expect more Europeans will stay in Europe for holidays. In our work, we consider many aspects of health, including very basic ones like drinking water and sanitation. In many of these aspects, Europe is very strong. Many people appreciate Europe as a safe and healthy holiday destination. Europe also has an excellent healthcare. So Europe is well placed for initiatives combining health, landscapes and tourism. When destinations want to become a green and a healthy destination, they need proper support. Doing an assessment or a certification is really very important, but it is not enough. You need to communicate the results of it. This scorecard gives you a summary of the 30 most important subjects of such an assessment. And look at the importance of nature and health indicators and criteria in our assessment scheme. We also make scorecards and dashboards that help politicians of the destination to compare their own destination with its, let's say, competitors in the country. This one we, that we did for Sound Duiveland in Zeeland. We also make dashboards to compare the quality of destinations with their tourism source markets. How nice, green and clean is this destination in Zeeland, Sound Duiveland, compared to where you live, for example, in Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Breda, Antwerp or Cologne. And we allow travelers to compare destinations in a country. Here you can see nine Dutch destinations that are compared on overall sustainability, health, accessibility, nature, culture, and outdoor experience. And all these are certified destinations in our program. When we certify businesses, we don't just give them a certificate. We give them a scorecard in the first place. This is an example for a diving school in Bonaire in the Dutch Caribbean. Again, nature and health are key issues here. And I apologize for the small letters, but it's just uh, for you to, give, to get an idea of the approach. Related to health, we offer businesses a special certification on virus awareness. This also results into a scorecard that they can share with their customers because this goes beyond legal requirements for COVID-19. It can build trust among customers to the, for the particular business. 
we developed this program in Bonaire together with RFEO in the Netherlands. These business scorecards allow us to compare certified businesses in one particular destination. All the tools that I presented are readily available. Every destination interested to focus on sustainability, health and nature can adopt this approach together with its business sector. This can help you to better inform travelers on how green and healthy you are. More information on our programs is available in these websites. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Albert. Um, very impressive how you make things measurable and, and also understandable for, for clients, for citizens, for people who want to choose. And uh, well, in free societies, people want to choose for themselves. And uh, I think you're accommodating that. And I think also your tools will help uh, perform better in time. It's not only comparing with the others, but also yourself and you will improve in time. And I think this is also an important mechanism for, for, for improvement. So thank you very much. And it's an impressive uh, piece of work you already did in these seven years. So thank you very much. We now go to Rob. Rob Walters, please. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, oh. And uh, uh, hello, everyone. And uh, a special welcome to Madalon as well. Uh, good to see you again after so many years. Um, I will address green and healthy destinations, the new paradigm. The world is changing fast. And, uh, health issues have arrived at the top of the political uh, pyramid. And it become increasingly clear that humans and nature are part of the same global ecosystems. If we humans try to disconnect, awful things can happen, such as the climate crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. The corona crisis is an unprecedented wake-up call, and unfortunately we already have several wake-up calls. But are we still asleep? We do uh, what we have to do or do differently. First of all, we have to change paradigms. As Einstein said, we cannot solve problems uh, with the same mindset that created them. We have to bring the concept one health to reality. Uh, the health of the planet is directly related to our health. Our health is directly related to the planet. And this kind of thinking should, uh, as I think, leads uh, all major policies and actions. And luckily things are changing slowly but surely uh, for the better in our thinking. One important example, uh, the World Health Organization says in its manifesto for a healthy recovery from COVID-19, that protecting nature should become priority number one. It's easy to understand the reason behind that, uh, because nature is the source of human health and existence. It's as simple as that, but in our daily lives, we often act like we can continue to dominate nature without serious implications. Also, the leisure industry is strongly dependent on nature and landscapes, as Albert Salman just highlighted. The leisure industry has been suffering a heavy blow from the corona-related lockdowns, and it still does. Many people are dying to travel again and visiting new destinations. But talking about changing paradigms, perhaps we should travel not so much anymore and should uh, uh, just uh, enjoy the am uh, amenities in the regions we live in. Healthcare is another sector where COVID resulted not only in an incredible burden, but also in rethinking of the current focus of healthcare on curing diseases instead of preventing diseases. It has become very clear uh, that we need our nature, our landscapes, also our gardens and our balconies to stay healthy, including mentally healthy. And we also need nature to work on our condition and in the immune systems to better uh, fight off viruses. Uh, parks and nature areas <coughs> in, many, <coughs> in many urbanized areas reach their limits in terms of visit visitors, not only uh, in, in terms of corona safety, but also in the pleasure of leisure. So I'm talking about the need to, need to change paradigms. And in this seminar, uh, it's about changing an important paradigm, removing the high fences between sectors such as leisure, healthcare and landscape management. 
as it's already happening in some regions, uh, such as the Gesundland for Bahn Eiffel and London National Park City. And we can, can learn a lot from those examples. But how to remove these fences between those areas? I think by integrating the concepts of green destinations with uh, healthy destinations into green and healthy destinations, as we do in this seminar, and, and through learning by doing, in particular, for instance, by boosting leisure activities, initiatives that integrate healthcare and nature-based health activities, such as spas, wilderness trips for former patients, cancer patients, and so on. By boosting healthcare initiatives that cultivate the good qualities of nature and landscapes, such as clean air, so, uh, salinated air and water, low noise area and, and areas and attractive nature and landscapes. Basically, those initiatives can be regarded as the new poor arts or spas. We had a lot of them in the past. By combining also rural activities such as horticulture and regional products restaurants with daycare activities for elderly people or young people with mental challenges. And last but not least, by spreading leisure related visits via zoning and careful plant routes, developing more green areas and give her better, better access to the countryside. Uh, to finalize, these activities offer considerable potentials for new business models that are, are not only based on uh, landscape qualities of regions, but also contribute to strengthening uh, these qualities. Green healthy destinations, the healing force of landscapes. Let this topic range high in our priorities in the post-corona area. We deserve it, but nature also deserve it. It deserves it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rob. I think um, you very well uh, clearly pointed out what well, are the challenges, but also the potential. And um, I think the window of opportunity uh, post-corona uh, gives us. I think the awareness has never been as high uh, as it as it is now. So I think let us build the bridges we need to overcome uh, the differences, the sectoralism and, 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 and break the fences as you uh, metaphorically said. So thank you very much for this intervention and you also made a bridge towards uh, the rest of, uh, of the world and Europe uh, to start with because uh, yes, I hailed uh, Van Gogh as uh, innovators but I also need, I think, the inspiration from other sides of the world, because this is a topic not only for the Netherlands or for Brabant. This is, a, I think, a universal topic, as you rightly uh, pointed it. So thank you very much, Rob. And uh, now we move to the to the last block before the break. This is two uh, daring and challenging and inspi inspiring examples. And the first one is the most well peculiar for me, because that has to do with London. And I, I well... The word smog was invented for, for London and this is not the most healthiest kind of air. So uh, you have to be a very daring person to, to present here. I think what uh, Daniel uh, uh, Raven Ellison is uh, going to present, but there is also a gorilla word in his, uh, in his title, which is also very, I think, uh, atypical, but when you have to be very bold and, and brave to be an innovator. So a gorilla person is perhaps a uh, good uh, explanation. So I first give the floor now to Daniel Raven Ellison to do his presentation on uh, on the London case. Please, Daniel. Great, thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you all and, and great to follow Rob as well with that really important vision, I think, of, of what helps the planet and great to be challenged as well on the idea of how a city, ridiculous idea, could be a national park. How can that be true? Um, um, I absolutely love that assertion. So um, I'm a guerrilla geographer. I'm a former geography teacher. Um, guerrilla geography is radical, alternative, surprising geographies that challenge both myself and others to think differently about the world. And eight years ago, I started a campaign that led a couple of years ago to London being declared the world's first national park city, which for many people may seem like a completely ridiculous idea. How can a city become a national park? Surely a national park is the complete opposite of what a city is all about. But perhaps now more than ever, all of us are finally realizing more and more that it's absolutely crucial that we have a better relationship with nature for our own health and well-being, the health and well-being of the planet and of the rest of nature, and the health and well-being actually 
of cities themselves. And, you know, where could we look to best in the world for inspiration around having a better relationship with nature? You know, we often think of cities as being the places of innovation with all the solutions and the idea that the countryside is somehow backwards. Whereas actually, if you look to national parks, these are places which for a very long time have been innovating and have had many of the best ideas about how we can have a better relationship with nature, for nature and for our own health as well. But when you look at that family of national parks around the world, what you begin to realise is that there are national parks that are glaciers, that are deserts, that are moorland, that are coral reefs, that are every single major type of internationally recognised landscape and habitat is in that family of national parks, apart from one which is the world's fastest grow growing uh, type of habitat and landscape, which is urban areas, urban areas where we live. And you know, for me personally, I don't think it makes sense to ex exclude our habitat where we live from this fantastic idea of national parks. And I'll give you four reasons from a nature conservation point of view. Firstly, I don't think that urban life is worth less than a rural life. The peregrine falcons, the world's fastest animal that live in London, they are just as beautiful, just as valuable, just as awesome as those that live in the countryside. And actually we have more breeding pairs of peregrine falcon in London than there are in Yosemite National Park. They love eating the parakeets and the pigeons. Secondly, you know, cities are enjoyable places. They are culturally, ecologically diverse places that can be phenomenally accessible to the widest range of people. I love going for a walk in the forest, but I love going for a walk in the city as well. Thirdly, vitally, you know, we know that orangutans need clean air, clean water, need trees. Well, go figure, so do humans too. Cities are not just cities, they are habitats, they're landscapes where, where we live. Finally, really importantly, when we think of nature conservation, people will often think of scientists working with charismatic, charismatic megafauna in some tropical distant location. But the places where most people have the most power to have the biggest influence on nature for themselves and for the rest of the world is where they are, which for most people in the world is in cities. And that's through their voting power, through their decision-making power, through their consumption power, but also their ability to literally green and rewild the places where they are. So London, love the challenge about the smog, right? I love that challenge. Um, love the challenge about the fact that the cities face problems. But the reason why the first national parks were created in United States and Canada and Australia wasn't because everything was right with the world. They were created because life needed protecting against threats of encroachment, of, of, of poor environmental quality, of overhunting. And we may face different threats as homo sapiens, as animals in cities, but we face problems as well that also need to be overcome through protecting our lives. So a national park is, yes, it's about celebrating what's great about a place, but it's also about overcoming challenges. So London is nearly 50% physically green. There are 15,000 species of wildlife in London, making it arguably the most biologically diverse region of the UK, far better than many of our rural national parks with some species of wildlife. There are as many trees as people um, in the city. So the London National Park City, as an idea, is about working with people across London, recognising everything that's been done in the city over the last 2,000 years to make the city greener, healthier, wilder, find ways to catalyse those actions so they spread out across the city more equitably. So the London National Park City is a place, it's a vision, it's a movement, it's a way of organising just like a rural national park, but organised for an urban setting. And what I realised by collaborating with people across London over many years is, you know, that it's not really an issue of representation, it's not really an issue that um, cities are missing from our family of national parks around the world. I came to realise that was a mistake. Actually, what the issue is, is that national park thinking is missing from our cities. And what I mean by that is landscape scale, large scale, long term thinking that's thinking holistically about all the system systems that go way beyond the administrative boundaries of the city. It's about augmenting the idea of a national park on top of a city. So we reframe what the purpose of a city is. A city is not just a place where we eat, sleep, work and watch Netflix. By saying it's a national park city, it's a place where we have a better relationship with nature and we enjoy ourselves outdoors more as well. The national park idea gives us a language, a story and a way of talking to each other, which is both works for an individual, but works at a city scale as well. So the London National Park City, which launched in 2019, you know, is all about increasing demand for more of the things we want to see more of in the city. And we do that through volunteer national park city rangers, festivals, films, partnerships, and catalyzing those good ideas. And it's been brilliant over the last few years to collaborate with colleagues, both in the Van Gogh National Park uh, that's emerging, but also in Breda 
and there are emerging campaigns for national park cities in Berlin, Tokyo, Adelaide, San Francisco, and there is an ambition of 30 to 25 national park cities around the world by 2025. And while there are many initiatives that focus on trees or skateboarding or cakes, the great thing about a landscape approach is that it is everyone, everything, everywhere, and the name of the game is to get more people on mission with making the city greener, healthier, and wilder. So it's a pleasure to share that vision with you, and hopefully it's no longer controversial and it all makes sense. Well, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. I think you, uh, you, you fulfilled your promise that you're uh, trying to take us along with a paradigm shift in our minds, eh, where gradually nature and culture have been divided, where, 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 where nature and, and, and humankind is not one of the same system. And I think uh, it's very, very fascinating work. And um, yes, I agree with you uh, that you have to go beyond greening the cities. You have to lay the bar very high and say, we want the concept of national parks. And that gives us a very much energetic driver to, to do the work you do. So I'm, I'm very much impressed and thank you for this intervention. Um, and I move to the last speaker before our break. Um, the area where I went as a little child with my parents, they loved uh, the area where this national park uh, or where this, uh, where this Gesundland initiative is. So I'm also very much looking forward to uh, the presentation of Valerie Schneider. Um, and she is, I hopefully present a whole other atmosphere, more uh, rural, but nevertheless, I think as exciting as what we heard from London. So Valerie, you have the floor, please. Thank you. So first I'm gonna start sharing my screen. So um, yeah, my name is Valerie Schneider. Um, I'm press relations officer of Gesundheit Vulkan Eifel. Um, first, I want to show you where uh, we are. So um, Gesundheit Vulkan Eifel is a region for close to uh, nature holidays in the southwest of Germany. We are located in the triangle between Cologne, Koblenz and Trier in the federal state of Rhineland Palatinate, not far from the borders to France, Luxembourg and Belgium. Our central vacation spots are the spa towns Down, Ulmen, Bad Bertrich and Manderscheid. And each of these places has its own sites that make them worth a visit. What unifies them is the unique landscape of the volcanic Eiffel. The landscape has therapeutic characteristic, such as spa towns, the impressive and spiritual nature and medical infrastructure. In total, there are more than 10 specialist clinic clinics in Gesundheit für Kahn Eifel, which actively integrate the landscape into their therapy. To give you an impression of Gesundheit für Kahn Eifel, I would like to show you our image video. So the image video gives a small insight into the region Gesundheit für Kahn Eifel and its therapeutic landscape. What we are focusing on is to enjoy to stay in nature and use its positive effects. The landscape is shaped from the power of volcanism, which created, for example, the Mars, the water-filled volcanic lakes or mineral springs and canyons. The nature invites you to be outside hiking and cycling. In addition to clinics and medical care centers, all over Gesundheit für Kahn Eifel, there are landscape elements available to increase well-being of body and mind. These landscape elements make our region special. Our concept of tourism incorporates those elements and markets them to nature-loving, health-conscious visitors. I would like to briefly introduce some of these elements to you. First of all, there is Römerkessel. 
a nature park in Bad Bertrich. The spa gardens and nature parks in Gesundheit für Kahn Eifel are based on the principles of landscape therapy. The park Römer Kessel is fully aligned with this concept. The park consists of seven different gardens. Each of these gardens should have its own effect on the visitor. So there is, for example, the garden of relaxation, where the visitor is supposed to come to peace and to himself. Or the herb garden, where the visitor is supposed to consciously perceive the different aromas of the herbs in the air. Since 2019, in the Römerkessel, there is the first Venus pathway in Europe. On this path, there are eight therapeutic stations to improve the health of the blood vessels and to prevent diseases such as thrombosis and strokes. The nearby Mosel Eiffel Clinic, one of Germany's largest Venus clinics, has initiated the Venus pathway and has trained its own Venus trainers who work with patients to improve Venus health along the pathway. The next video gives you an impression of the Venus pathway. On, there is the path of mindfulness in Manderscheid, called Achtsamkeitspfad Kleine Kühl. It's a seven kilometer trail that leads along the river Kleine Kühl. There are seven stations along the way that are meant to help the guests to discover the therapeutic power of landscape and to walk with more mindfulness in nature. The stations were developed according to psychological concepts. Guests can experience different moments in nature here. For example, taking off the shoes and go barefoot in the water of Kleine Kühl, feeling its refreshment, or having a break in the middle of nature on one of the hammocks. Mental health is the focus of the concept on the path of mindfulness. I also want to tell you about Drese. There are more than 30 mineral water and carbon dioxide springs in Gesundheit für Kahn Eifel, which are called Drese. They originate in the former volcanic activity of the region, and many, many hiking trails lead to the springs. Many of Drese are drinkable. Each Drese has its own taste. Due to its high mineralization, the water of the Drese is considered to be healthy and beneficial. The best known spring in Gesundheit für Kahn Eifel is the Bergquelle from Bad Bertrich whose famous chlorbosol water feeds the well-known Vulcan Eiffel Therm in Bad Bertrich. Something special is our guided tour series Experience Nature Actively. These are tours with our tour guides who have specially trained by us. They have undergone training that qualifies them as relaxation coach or landscape mentor. Relaxation coaches build their tours on a spiritual level and include elements such as yoga or small fantasy trips in their tours. Anita Otten on the left side is a relaxation coach. She offers guided tours through the Landscape Therapy Park Römerkessel, which I have just mentioned. Landscape mentors introduce visitors to the volcanic past of the area and explain how the traces of volcanism can still be seen in the landscape today. Elisabeth Schäfer on the right side is a landscape mentor. On her guided tour through the, year, through the year with white herbs, she shows guests which herbs grow in the volcanic Eiffel and how they can be used. There are other landscape mentor tours, such as health hiking or forest bathing. So to conclude, every nature lover will find something special in Gesundheit für Kahn Eiffel, as there is so much more to see and to discover here like old castles, museums, 
natural swimming pools, mountain bike trails, hiking trails and wellness facilities. Our mission sums up to Augenblicke Abenteuer Auszeiten, which means moments, adventures, timeouts. Gesundheit Vulkan Eifel creates natural tourism that helps to get healthy and stay healthy. We believe that nature is healing and we make use of the natural life force that Earth is giving us. So this was my little insight in Gesundheit für Kahn Eifel. I hope you have been inspired and have a glimpse of how we interpret and implement therapeutic landscape. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie. I think, uh, uh, well, what I, I think is very impressive is that you are very advanced in translating the natural capital of this beautiful area into very targeted services to people. Uh, and I think this is, I think, very appealing, but very well advanced. So I think this is, uh, well, uh, it's fascinating to see the differences between uh, the achievements of, of London and what you, the aspiration is there and where you are today with your with your package of services and also your facilities with the with the clinics and all. So this is, I think, very inspiring for 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 the rest of us, especially I think for the Netherlands and the, and countries who could uh, who could only dream to have such a beautiful a package of, uh, of uh, services already in place. Uh, well, this, uh, I think, were the two uh, practical inspirational examples before our break. I think we have one or two minutes for questions, especially, I think, for the last two speakers, because there could be informative questions. Uh, as, as said, the more, the more other interventions we, I would like to do on the exchanging views block of our, of our afternoon. Yes, sure, Andre. Actually, we do have some questions. Um, they're coming from uh, uh, Nana, I'm, I'm very sorry for the pronunciation, Lakvik, that uh, I believe it, it's a Nature for Health collaborator and the question is going to Valerie directly. And it's mainly about uh, dealing with the overcrowding. So the question is, uh, do you suffer from overcrowding and littering in your area? So if so, how do you deal with this situation? Uh, no, we are very happy that we have not this problem here up to now and hope that it will uh, stay this way. <laughs> so I think you're, you're lucky there because uh, yes. like in, in a crowded country like the Netherlands, we have a lot of uh, waste dumping, even uh, drug dumping or residues of drugs. So there is a lot of also, well, not so nice things we have to yeah. deal with uh, in, in uh, other situations. Uh, we have some crowded points here, but um, fortunately, we have not a problem with littering so far. Okay, thank you. And Nina, an another question, perhaps? If not, Nina, is there another question uh, to put before the break, okay. or do we? Okay, and then we have a note from you for for you, Valerie. Yeah. Okay, I believe uh, Nina is having some technical trouble, so I will be uh, reading out the question. So it's about the internationality of your guests. Uh, Anne is asking uh, how the mix of your guests is and if there are a lot of international guests as well. Most of our guests are from Germany, uh, but we have also guests from Netherlands and Belgium and from Great Britain, but um, not from so far away or from... Um, not from Europe, so most of them don't want to travel as far, so they use it for short trips. And uh, adding to that question, uh, debate in the Netherlands is, is do the insurance companies pay for uh, like a treatment in Vulcan Eiffel? Uh, it, it is an old story in the Netherlands that the cure or the they were like subsidized by the by the by the health system. Is that still the case, or is it own pocket money? Because then you have the well, the solidarity question that not everybody could afford to go there. Yes, most of it you have to pay by yourself, but um, there are some some packages that you can book directly. I don't know how it how it is called in, in English, the the health service maybe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there are services, but um, most uh, you have to pay pay by yourself. Okay, thank you. A last one, perhaps? Yes, and this one is going to Daniel, actually. And uh, I think it's coming from uh, Frank. 
because he's wondering, um, in his opinion, uh, what uh, according to your presentation, that's all about a mind shift. So cities more rural, nature more urban. And he's asking your opinion on this. Daniel, please, can you give some feedback on this uh, on this question? Well, something is not working, I think. Yes. Well, perhaps we should. Yes, maybe we will take a break now and then we yeah, can Yeah, take also... the break now and bring the answer uh, later on in the program. Uh, so thank you all very much for this part of the, of the seminar. And we have now a break till 10 past three and uh, have a little uh, exercise, do some mindfulness. You have also very short ones. Uh, I see you back at 15.10. Okay, good afternoon. We reopen uh, our seminar and uh, also welcome to the provincial minister. Alice, I see you on my screen uh, at the top. Uh, so welcome, nice to have you with Thank us. You. I'll Thank come you, back Andrew. to you uh, later in the program. Um, yes. I think we had an excellent uh, first half of the game and uh, of our meeting, very inspirational, good examples, ambitious, mm -hmm. mind-blowing sometimes even. Uh, so uh, that is a promise for you to do our best for the second half. Uh, mm -hmm. And the second half will start again by uh, the idea that um, if you do something new, you think you're alone, but you look around and you see there are others. And sometimes you think alone you go the, f the fastest. But uh, in the Dutch, we have a saying that together you make the most progress. So uh, find your partners and, and do it. So our next two speakers are Dr. Carolina Doughty and uh, Hewet Chen Hu, if I pronounce it correctly, from Wageningen University and Research Center. And they're going to uh, clarify with us how to identify, define, and connecting healing landscapes in Europe. So you both have the floor, please, um, for your presentation. Thank you very much. So, um, Connie, if you can make that a full screen. Thank you very much. So, uh, hello everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, symposium today and uh, have uh, heard all the interesting and inspiring contributions so far. Um, I'm Carolina Doughty. I'm an assistant professor at uh, Wageningen University in the cultural geography. And uh, I do research on the connections between well-being and landscape. And um, I do a lot of work with the concept of therapeutic landscape that we'll be talking about today. And uh, I give this presentation together with uh, Connie Hu, a um, student on our master program in tourism, society and environment, and who is also currently doing an academic internship with Nature for Health. And uh, she will tell you more about that in, in a moment. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please, Connie. Okay, so today um, I will start by giving a brief introduction and definition of the concept of therapeutic landscape, uh, which supports the themes and the vision um, of healing landscapes that we're talking about today, and that can assist us in identifying and linking up healing places um, uh, across Europe, uh, potentially anywhere in the world. Um, and then Connie will take this forward. She will give you some uh, nice inspiring examples from parks and regions around Europe, and then introduce the, the network of green healthy destinations uh, that we're taking steps towards setting up today. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so today we're talking about this uh, idea of healing and health promoting potential of green landscapes and um, you've heard some great examples in the earlier presentations and uh, there is thankfully a growing awareness, uh, as Rob said earlier, across many different domains that landscape and health are linked in various important ways. And uh, undoubtedly the pandemic is, is also playing a part in, in raising awareness around this too. Um, the academic concept of therapeutic landscape, 
um, I think provides a nice framework for how to study the role of specific places, specific landscapes in the promotion of health and well-being. Um, this is a concept already with a, a rich sort of research history behind it. Um, it's been around for about 30 years. There are hundreds of, hundreds of studies um, that back up uh, and, and sort of give um, sort of, a, yeah, a, back, a scientific background to, to the kind of things that I will be uh, talking about. Um, it's built on a three-dimensional model that includes three changing types of environments. Uh, the physical environment, including both natural and built types of landscapes, uh, the social environment, which includes things like social perceptions, cultural elements, behavior, and so on. And, and finally, this, the symbolic environment that refers to meanings and values that we hold as a society and as individuals about things like healing and health and, and also about nature and the role of of nature in our lives. And uh, it's really about the interaction between these different elements, the physical, the social, the mental, the spiritual, that contribute to create sites that are experienced as positive for well-being. So in practice, this means that the landscape is, is really regarded as an active component in the emergence of positive health outcomes, um, specifically through bridging the social and the material. So what I think is noteworthy and relevant for our purpose today is that the concept of therapeutic landscape really has wide applicability. It's broad in scope and in scale. It's not just one type of landscape or one type of use that defines a therapeutic landscape. It's uh, applicable across many different types of landscapes, as we've heard already and uh, at different scales from the very intimate and local to uh, the much broader to, to whole regions, as we heard in the previous uh, presentations. And it can encompass different types of activities and experiences ranging from very ordinary and everyday to extraordinary and, and more sort of tourism associated experiences. Um, and it applies uh, as much in, in recovery from illness as it does uh, from a perspective of uh, prevention and positive health. So uh, to, to finalize, uh, I want to, to highlight a couple of things that I think um, are, are valuable about the therapeutic landscape concept. Um, and that makes it valuable, especially for this vision of healing landscape that we're talking about today. And uh, the first is related to, um, um, to the understanding and vision. Sorry, could you, yes, that one. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the understanding and vision of health that we're talking about when we're talking about therapeutic landscapes um, and health promoting landscapes. So by definition, because we have landscape in, in the word, we're talking about an expansive and a holistic understanding of what health is. And uh, an understanding that is based on the knowledge that health is not just an individual matter, um, or indeed not just a human matter. It's something that's created and sustained across individual, social and environmental dimensions. So in the research field, we talk about needing to simultaneously look outward to context and inward to meaning in order to understand health. So on one hand, it's about incorporating the cultural and symbolic meanings of landscapes. And uh, Van Gogh National Park is such a wonderful example of doing this. Um, and it's also about looking at, for example, how social inequalities map onto these landscapes and how more people can access and benefit from them. And uh, just finally, I want to highlight that uh, this is a living concept and there is a lot of potential for further learning about different kinds of landscapes, different kinds of users and different groups of users and, and their needs and characteristics. And uh, so there is a lot of potential for partnerships and for learning uh, across different sectors and domains. Uh, so I'm excited to see what happens with the, the learning network that hopefully will be one of the outcomes of today and uh, how this vision of healing landscapes can be taken forward. So on this note, I will hand over now to Connie, who will show you some examples and talk about the 
um, Healing Green Destinations Network. Yeah, sure. Um, wait, next slide. Um, thank you, Carolina, for giving a holistic overview of what therapeutic landscape is in such a small amount of time. And thank you for introducing me. Um, I'm Hui Xing, as always, go by the name of Connie. So in the following slide, I will um, identify healing landscape by making use of three examples from material, social, and super spiritual, or in other words, symbolic dimension to help you further the understanding of therapeutic landscape. Let's first look into the material dimension where people normally gain the multi-sensory experiences in a space. Um, so in this park in Thousand, Germany, you could have the experiences of walking bare food over the grassland, uh, the sand, the wood chips and mud in which the exercise itself um, benefits your physical well-being. And when coming across sensory um, station or just simply um, along the trail, um, the white soundscape, the color that nature wears, the smell of the fresh air, and the touch of the nature allows you to engage all your senses, which you could experience the healing effect. Um, Move on to the social dimension. The following examples indicate how nature areas facilitate psychological interventions program to take place. Olu regions um, situated in central Finland and in this area, healthcare professionals or even nursing students uh, utilize the health enhancing effects of nature to provide therapy in natural environments. Uh, for instance, you could look at this picture that uh, employees it's undertaking a occupational therapy. Also to um, prevent social exclusions among young people and immigrants or a certain target groups uh, undergoing rehabilitation. They encourage them to undertake nature related activities. Well, here comes to the last example. It might be a bit out of the blue because it, it this goes beyond um, the conventional natural landscape. It shows that the beauty landscape also has the potential to be healing landscape. For example, the uh, Buglia uh, re region in the southern Italy is renowned for its traditional drilling conical shape houses, uh, truly, which found only in this region. So this cultural and historical heritage has a symbolic meaning to the local community. Besides the healing practices in Bulia also manifests in the region, uh, in the religious tours, all the sizes like churches, monastery and pilgrimage are sacred places for pilgrim, monk, and it remains the spiritual power. Lastly, um, the offer of the yoga and wellness retreat enable the visitors to experience healing effects. Lastly, speaking for Green Destination and Nature for Health, we want to deliver an idea of setting up uh, a learning network for green and healthy destinations across Europe. The value of the network is twofold. Firstly, the pandemic not only take a toll on peoples from all walks of life and um, in which the quality of our life have been affected, um, but also deal a massive blow in um, the healthcare system. Um, but meanwhile, fortunately, uh, the health promoting effects of nature are increasingly recognized and more people are getting back to nature. So we believe the use of green space or nature in general will continue to encourage and support green leisures and its benefit in the post COVID um, season, which I hope is coming soon. And moreover, the network will facilitate cross sectoral collaboration 
and support entrepreneur uh, innovations. Furthermore, this is a platform for green and healthy destination to exchange experiences, views, expertise on the integration of leisure, um, nature, landscape, and healthcare. We aim to set up a more inclusive network based on what exists, uh, which incorporate the destination not only uh, from a macro scales like regions, national parks, but also include the micro scales uh, such as villages or communities. Last but not least, if you'd like to get involved in the learning network or you have any suggestions and source that springs to your mind, please feel free to um, reach to me. And um, here's my email address. And that's the end of our presentation. And if you have any questions or remarks, um, welcome to leave it in the, in the chat. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Connie, and also uh, Carolina for your both introductions uh, and also, uh, I think, for your appeal. I think um, when you want to bring this item further, you have to have to bring the evidence together, uh, but you also bring the experiences and uh, the learning effects together. And when you want to come together, you need a kind of informal structure or more or less formal structure. And that's your appeal to all the participants. And I'll come back to that in our exchanging flus block. But for myself, uh, 20 years ago, the, the National Health Institutes formed a peer-to-peer -peer network in the world. And uh, well, RFEM was one of the founding fathers and I never regretted that, that RFEM was one of the founding fathers. So if one of the participants now is hearing the appeal to become one of the founders of this uh, learning network, uh, please come. To the, to the email or to the chat and, and make yourselves known. And of course, we hope for some, uh, some front runners as we heard today already. Yeah. So thank you again. And now we go back to the Netherlands again and to one of our perhaps most uh, advanced core order or health uh, uh, parks besides Van Gogh, of course. Uh, we go now to Ameland and we go to, to uh, Dr. Kees van der Ploeg, president of the board of the corporation Bloom Healthy Life and CML. Uh, CMC, sorry, change agents. Um, so, Kees, you have the floor. Thank you. I have to press share screen. Uh, yes. If you have, yes, correct, correct. Okay, I pressed. <laughs> and then you have to pick your presentation. Uh, well, uh, where's my presentation? Oh, here. No. Again. If you like, I can share it for you. Yes, please. Yes, it is. So can you give it on the full screen? One second. No. Well, oh, please start talking, uh, Kees. I, I, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, I'm pleased to be invited to tell about healing environment on, uh, on Ameland. And I'm a chairman of uh, Bloom Healthy Life and of Change Management Consultants. And you see the lighthouse of the island Ameland. In the beginning, we called our corporation the Davos of the North also a green destination in Switzerland. And in Davos, our country has a center for severe lung patients, for asthma and COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And patients stay there during three months to recover and to tackle their illness. But it costs 60,000 euro per patient for these three months. And because Switzerland is so expensive, it was difficult for patients to meet their friends and families. And as a management consultant, I've been working 
for the long funds is a patient organization and a lung specialist and friend of mine told me do you know that salty air has the same impact as high mountain air and as a consultant and economist i have been thinking we have to treat the lung patients here along the coast and to make a long story uh, short the birth of bloom health alive appeared one year ago on an island where the air is salty and the lowest level of fine dust exists paul van spiegel the uh, lung uh, doctor and i created a corporation for prevention and vitalization on um, Ameland, and it's a real in a real healing environment besides Besides, uh, please the next the next slide. Besides, Corona appears, and doctors doctors say Corona interferes with our lifestyle with a great precision. Next, please, because there is an increasing life expectation in the Western Corona world. And the expected quality of life and subsequent years of good health have not increased accordingly. And the price we have to pay for our nowadays lifestyle, you can see it in all kinds of diseases, illnesses caused as a result of our lifestyle choice, like obesity, diabetes, excessive stress, heart and vascular diseases, cancer and organ diseases. And all these diseases are caused by negative behavioral factors. Next sheet, please. Negative behavioral factors like bad eating habits, alcohol, nicotine, and lack of exercise. And currently in the Netherlands, half of the population is overweight, a quarter of the population smokes, the average alcohol intake is worrying. Many people have bad eating habits and a lack of exercise. And the results of the result of this figure is Handbook Leefstijlgeneeskunde, the book of lifestyle medical science. And it's interesting to see that in a very short period, lifestyle is a medical science nowadays. The price we pay altogether, the financial consequences, all this adds up to 20% of the burden of disease, 35,000 deaths per year, and structural expense of 9 billion euros all in our country. So we have enough evidence for blue healthy life for active lifestyle intervention. And lifestyle intervention is an effective way to change behavior. And our solution, our solution is realize future-proof care on Ameland based on the natural healing environment of the island. Realize slow tourism on, on Ameland and sustain, sustainability of the healthcare wish of our minister. And we call this care tourism and also do research to the added value of long revalidation in high mountains because there is less added value for being for such a long time in the high mountains to um, uh, treat the lung illnesses. And the prevention agreement of Paul Blockhaus, that is a uh, vice minister, and he said, we like to deliver money for integrative, integrative lifestyle intervention. So our mission, so our mission, the mission of Bloom Healthy Life is to be leading in lifestyle intervention, leading in Europe. A Bloom Healthy Life is directed towards clients with a chronic vitality question that need care in the form of medical and paramedical care in the broadest sense of the word. And we provide them with the healing environment of Ameland 
that stimulates the quality of their lives and, de and decreases their need and consumption of healthcare. Bloom Healthy Life supports the client in striving for the most adequate dealing with their vitality problems, preserving as much quality of living as possible. In order to make this possible, we offer consistent professional care based on the best practices and the most up-to-date medical ideas and care content. This care is offered through commitment, a safe climate, and with respect for anyone's worldview. The question for care is leading. We have some targets, and the targets are creating new worlds based on people, planet, and profit. Improving future proof care on Ameland through using the high um, air quality and the possibilities in facility services. We found an hotel, and that hotel has been rebuilt for lung patients. So there is low fine uh, dust and low allergy. And we like to create a high quality holistic prevention and fatality for Dutch as well as international uh, clients working towards our goal of sustainable care and self-management. And for the target audience of the heart and lung patients, we offer heart and lung fatality care in a network model in an ambulant residential setting because the, re the resident is the hotel, so it is a form of care tourism, like the spas in our um, uh, lecture of Valerie Schneider. And it is tourism because it is possible to go there with your family. And we like also uh, uh, to create the availability of diagnostic on the island in the polytechnic. We like to create an oasis for care for the patients and their family. And we're offering a benefit system, and a benefit system that's called Vital 10, and that is a system, a kind of e-health system that stimulates patients to actively continue working with their vitality program after the stay on the island uh, as well. And we follow the patient in monitoring uh, the achieve, uh, the, the, uh, to achieve their goals. For instance, when you have a BMI of 30 and you say, I like to realize a BMI of uh, 26 or make every day uh, 10,000 steps or swim during half an hour uh, a day. And we have a platform so the uh, uh, um, patients can talk with each other during one year and they can also talk with the available uh, doctors. Ace, you're running out of time now. Okay. <laughs> can you please conclude? Yeah. We like also making arrangements of healthcare insurance companies to give our bonuses in order to realize their targets. We have programs for individuals, general vitality programs, heart revalidation programs, lung disease programs, quit smoking, weight loss programs, and mindfulness intensive. And we also have programs for uh, the same programs for organizations. So we have... Um, I tried to to finish my my um, my story. So we have the availability of the lowest finders level in the Netherlands and salt water resources, and we have nights they are very dark and quiet. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Sorry to to uh, interrupt you so harshly, but uh, we have a very tight schedule as we know, yeah. and I think. Yeah. Uh, I think the level of detail of your slides will not get lost because we will send them to all the participants yeah. so uh, they, hey, can, nice. they can yeah. read them and can find you for questions uh, also later on, but also on the on the connection of the learning network, I hope. So it's very impressive, really, also a medical uh, 
uh, origin of your of your initiative. I think uh, this is very interesting uh, angle. So thank you very much for that. Okay, you're welcome. Now we go back to the Netherlands and to Van Gogh, and uh, I, I'm glad to introduce to you uh, Ivo Kortman, the president of the Van Gogh National Park and also of the uh, Landscape Triennale 2021. Uh, Ivo, you have the floor, please. Ivo? Yes, I can hear you now. You can hear me? Yes, and see you now, full screen. Oh yeah, now, now it's better, yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I have no slides, but I have a, a, a beautiful film. But first I want to introduce myself. I am Ivo Kortman. I am married to Carla, four married children and a dozen grandchildren. So I'm a happy man and live in Oosterwijk, center of Van Gogh, Van Gogh National Park. In my young years, I was mayor of for almost 35 years successively in Baden-Nassau, in Oosterwijk, in Best and in Waalde. Four Brabant municipalities, all situated in Van Gogh National Park. I have been chairman for 10 years of Het Groene Woud. And for that, and that's the reason that I became chairman of Van Gogh National Park in uh, 2017. And now also chairman of the landscape triennale from this year, in which framework we are now together. So you have heard Van Gogh National Park is a movement that has emerged in Brabant in recent years and now has over 50, 50 partners, partners. The latest so far is Nature for Health, the organizer of this uh, beautiful day, Heland Landschap Dag. But first now I'm going to show you the wonderful video about Van Gogh National Park. Start the video. Welcome to the center of Brabant a landscape with meandering streams, vast nature reserves and estates, and beautiful village and cityscapes. This is the landscape Vincent van Gogh fell in love with, with the nature, the scenery, and the hardworking people, a landscape that inspired him to create masterpieces. A beautiful area with 1.5 million inhabitants, Amidst a booming economy, this blend of exceptional landscape, thriving economy and heritage of Van Gogh is unique. But this wonderful region also faces great challenges. The changing climate, the construction of houses, businesses and roads, the energy transition and the challenges for the food and agricultural industry. The landscape and nature are under pressure. Fortunately, a lot of work is already being done to sustain and invigorate our nature and landscape by governments, organizations, and volunteers who together make a difference. But more than ever, it's time to actively engage with one another to help, challenge, and inspire each other to not only face the challenges of this region, but to also utilize them in order to create even more added value to our nature and to our landscape. Not only in our nature reserves, but also beyond. Together, we create new opportunities, which is why we now present Van Gogh National Park. A national park under development where we can work together on the quality of nature and the restoration of biodiversity in a vital landscape that simultaneously creates revenue. With Van Gogh National Park, we work towards the reinforcement of international settlement in Brabant on a healthy future for farmers 
and for all other entrepreneurs. On special experiences for local and non-local visitors, and above all, on beautiful and healthy surroundings for the inhabitants of this unique region. This can only be achieved if we get moving together, with Vincent as primary inspiration, because, just like him, we like to do things slightly differently, with lots of creativity, innovative solutions, and the power of imagination. Because we are the smartest region for a reason, with many creative minds, entrepreneurs, and go-getters, Van Gogh is in our nature. With Van Gogh National Park, we initiate a movement in and around the many nature reserves and into the heart of the villages and cities. Let's work together with lots of creativity and imagination towards our landscape of the future. Welcome to Van Gogh National Park. Thank you. Actually, these beautiful images need no further explanation, but I'll try anyway. What kind of movement is Van Gogh National Park? It distinguishes itself because it's a national park new style, in which the metropolitan, metropolitan knowledge economy of Rainport and the Brabant City are combined with beautiful nature areas, small-scale stream landscapes, and the legacy of Vincent van Gogh. It's, and the film said it already, it's unique. Van Gogh National Park in a region with almost one and a half million inhabitants. The second largest economic in uh, the Netherlands and one of the smartest regions in the world. It's homeland to varied protective nature reserves, meandering streams, characteristic cultural landscapes, and many villages and towns in green surroundings. A top economy in a top landscape. That's precisely why it's now a, new, a national park new style. It's a robust, strong, of international stature, and the focus is very broad. It's not, isolated, it's not an isolated island, but stands in the middle of the society. Agriculture, economy, education, recreation, tourism, the cities and the villages are all part of it. The strength, the, the, naturally, the strengthening of the nature and the landscape remains the top priority, but in such a way that the whole society benefits from it. The life ability and experienceability for and, for and invo involvement of the inhabitants, volunteers and entrepreneurs is essential. It is clear that precisely the health of these same residents as well uh, as that of the visitors must play a prominent role in the ambitions of our movement Van Gogh National Park. In this age of Corona, you wouldn't have to explain it at all. It's almost idiot to explain it. That's why Van Gogh National Park is so pleased that Nature for Health, among all those other 50, uh, part 50 partners, has joined us as partner. Their goal is to improve the quality, the quality of life and the, the living uh, environment by connecting health and nature and landscape. And that fits in perfectly with the ambitions of Van Gogh National Park. Nature for Health wants, just like Van Gogh National Park, to be a platform for scientists, for residents, for entrepreneurs, for governments, social organizations and education institutions to exchange knowledge and experience and to allow ideas to flourish and to be put into a practice. That cooperation is also the mark of the movement. Van Gogh National Park is therefore certainly not an area authority with, a kind of, with all kinds of powers, but a movement in which everyone wants to participate and to be connected. The joint realization of our compass, the master plan Van Gogh National Park sketchbook for the landscape of the uh, 21 century, uh, and that should come, and that should come straight from the heart of everyone involved. With that motto, we are all together, Van Gogh, 
we want to realize our ambitions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished speaker. I think this is a very, very challenging message, and not only in National Park new style, but also being a movement, because I think it's about people and inspiration of people. And uh, well, being a mayor and being so close to the to your citizens, you you uh, you are a very daring man to to do this very innovative uh, journey for 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 Van Gogh and um, we are very very happy as Nature for Health to, to be a partner of this beautiful uh, uh, new style park so thank you very much for your introduction and the beautiful uh, movie um, I think uh, we have now the block with uh, with the possible exchange of views appeals interventions and um, I think Nina will help me to select because we cannot do every everyone. Uh, I see more than 40 interventions on the chat, so we can't give the floor to 40 people in, in 30 minutes. So uh, let's do a selection yes. and Nina is helping with me with it. Um, I'm aware of the fact that per possibly uh, Mr. Caliano uh, is in our in, in, in our company. Mm -hmm. And if so, I would like him to give a very yes, short. Yes, uh, I am indeed. Yes. The only thing is, I, I, there is no way I can uh, show yourself. Okay. Turn the, let us, the let video us help on. you. If you can put it on. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. No, I think it's on. Okay. Now I think my video is on. Thank you very much for this kind of invitation. I worked for the Council of Europe for 33 years in environment and also on heritage. And uh, in the 90s, we were very hot about green tourism. We said, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we can go there before tourists do. Only we had a number of projects in the Ukrainian Carpathians or in the Latvian forest with these beautiful wooden churches, only to find out that perhaps we had arrived too soon because there were too many Kalashnikovs and not enough toilets for Western tourists. Anyway, that the Council of Europe, we have a very beautiful program that has to deal with tourism and heritage. And this program is called the Cultural Roots of the Council of Europe. By the way, I think it would be good to prepare a Van Gogh cultural root of the Council of Europe because it would fit all the values that we want to show at the Council of Europe. You know, in these uh, routes, and I will finish very shortly, we have routes like the St. James Way, you know, which goes around thousands of kilometers around Europe where people actually walk before COVID. You know, we had like uh, half a million people arriving to Santiago of Compostela in North Spain as registered pilgrims for which they have to walk the last 200 kilometers because we have thousands and thousands more that never get there or just do one bit of the St. James Way in France or in Latvia. We have also a route on the olive tree. We have a wine route for health. And of course, the thermal towns. So, you know, this is a very interesting program of the Council of Europe, the cultural roots of the Council of Europe, in which we want to promote Council of Europe values, health, but also human rights, and, uh, you know, a shared a cultural identity for all Europeans. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I know there are more people that want to participate, so I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Galliano. And I was told you were with us uh, from the very early start supporting this whole idea. So thank you for your for your intervention. Uh, second, I want to call to, uh, I, I asked uh, Albert Salman, who is one of your champions for green destinations. And he immediately said the Azores. And I was told that perhaps Carolina, if I'm correctly, is somebody representing the Azores and want to have a short intervention. Yes, is this possible? Uh, yes, Andre, I think, I'm sorry. I think due to technical difficulties, Carolina is not here with us today. Okay, okay, that's a pity, that's a pity. Sorry. Um, and Ignaz, is he there? From Europarks? Uh, no, Ignaz could not be with us uh, today. 
Okay, okay. Well, then, uh, Nina, come up with um, some burning questions or interventions from, from the chat, because I was not able, following the whole discussion, to, to read them. Of course, of course. So, actually, there is a question that goes back to the beginning of the presentation, directed to Albert Salman from Ilaria84, that she's uh, uh, following us from Italy. And it's mainly a question about data collection on the environmental performances. So the, the, the question is, which kind of data do you collect on environmental performances? And if you, if you can give some example, because she was very impressed about this. So um, Albert, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm involved in, in dealing with data for indeed uh, quite a few years. We are using a combination of uh, sources. In the first place, uh, I showed uh, some global maps on, for example, uh, sanitation and drinking water and, uh, and healthcare. We make use of um, global indexes that we, uh, of course, check on the reliability. Uh, for the um, scorecards, we make use of the results of certification. So either destination certification or business certification. So that's expert assessments supported by an external independent auditor. Dashboards are created with information from destinations that participate in such assessment and certification programs, and we have a hundred, so it's sometimes uh, possible to uh, to create such dashboard with local information. But we mostly used you yeah used and still use information from public databases that are not always uh, easily accessible. So we have a data project with several universities in the Netherlands in which we access data from uh, European databases, global databases, and national databases. And that has resulted into really a huge database uh, for about 60 indicators uh, for every of the 950,000 municipalities in Europe. So that's a unique database in which we can create uh, such dashboard for almost every destination in Europe. Um, and then we have... Um, course other local sources that can be added to it but these are the main sources of information okay thank you uh, albert and i think uh, for lifestyle interventions the, the national health institutes are sharing uh, health information systems also with the aid of europe and with who and, and the oecd so i think well data are there but i think the most hard thing is to have good data analysts and to have a good interpretation of the data and there is i think where institutes ngos and networks come together to have this kind of correct or shared interpretation because raw data is well we all know <laughs> you can manipulate it and i think the certification part of the answer of of um, of albert was i think the strongest part because that is what the citizens want is it really autonomous is it independent and is it is it reliable thank you very much next uh, item uh, please nina Yes, of course. So uh, going back, we already had a question. Microphone, from... please. Oh. Can you hear me? No. no? I can't yes. hear you, Nina. You... Yeah, we can hear you. Ah, you can? OK. Yes. OK. Um, so uh, it's a question coming from Anne, who asked already a question earlier uh, to Valerie. But now I, I believe that this question is a bit directed to everyone. And it's always about the littering problem in rural areas. So she's asking basically how, in, in your opinion, in general, so for the speakers, how best to solve a littering problem in a rural area? And if you have any ideas for wording uh, of uh, signing and signs and how to, to spread this. Sorry, I Nina, I, I was, uh, my, my, my audio was, who, who was the question to? Um, actually, a bit to all the speakers. Because oh, but we I'd... should select one, eh? Um, perhaps well, along, uh, Daniel, perhaps? I don't know if Dan is still here because I know that he had to leave for other purposes. Uh, Teresa Connie, he's not here anymore, right? I can't see him anymore, no. Sorry. Uh, no. Maybe, maybe. well, Valerie, you said that you didn't have any problems with the, with the littering. So maybe you can explain how do you manage not to have these problems. I, I believe that you could be the... Uh, best person to address this question to? Or? Um, yes, I don't know how maybe the persons are um, very sensible here to our environment because um, we don't do anything special. 
I really cannot say why we haven't the problem here. We only we are happy that we have it he, uh, have it, don't have the problem here up to now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, my answer should be what I know of is there are a lot of lot of citizen initiatives, cooperatives who, who are trying to collect litter. Um, and of course, there is also the, the, the covenants, the contracts with the industry who is causing the litter. And, and uh, for example, in the Netherlands, new legislation is underway to ban the, the, the tin cans, to ban certain kinds of litter uh, causing uh, packages. So I think these are examples I know of, but well, I come a lot of in France and I think literary, literary problem, littering problem is, is everywhere where there is a big intensive use of the of the of the facilities and uh, well to solve it is i think a very big challenge so i congratulate uh, vulcan eiffel that you are <laughs> still not in that phase but well sooner or later you have to deal with it i think is there another item nina for us to deal with uh, actually there was a last one uh, it's uh, a bit uh, um, let's say uh, put for thought in the sense of kind of a mind shift that Frank, our speaker, was posing in the presentation to Dan. So maybe now as Dan is not here, we can, I don't know, maybe propose it to Albert or Rob. And he was talking that it's all about mind shift. So cities are more rural, uh, na nature is more urban. So what is your opinion about that? How do you think about this mind shift? Rob, perhaps? Yeah, it's, it's a challenging um, uh, statement. When I read it, uh, I said, indeed, uh, cities be have to become net more natural. We have to integrate green uh, um, in, at local level, regional level, uh, starting with our own gardens and balconies, uh, not to forget, with uh, our very important green areas as well, uh, related to our health. Uh, but I'm not sure uh, we uh, always have to urbanize nature, which also was uh, part of that statement. Um, I think what we have to do is uh, when we urbanize and we uh, need to uh, put no, new houses or industry, uh, we have to put nature as an underlayer uh, and not as uh, the end of a process uh, where, uh, in fact, uh, nature always uh, suffers uh, from uh, other functions. So basically, my, my plea would be to uh, integrate nature in the very first stages of uh, planning processes uh, related to, to building houses, neighborhoods, or industries. And uh, I think that would uh, result in a um, uh, much improved living environment uh, for people as well. Thank you. Okay, Albert, you want to add yeah, or maybe, have another position? Yeah, thank you. Maybe a sh short addition to that. I think I think the Corona crisis has um, resulted into a mind shift for many people, especially city dwellers. I mean, they have been locked down in in very very many cities for a while, and they couldn't sometimes not even access a green park. So once that became again possible, people have been looking for uh, to escape actually from their flats, from their urban areas to first to the city parks and then to national parks, rural areas, green areas. So they're looking for balance. They, they live in a, in, a, in a city and they, they, they want to go out of the city. And for people living in the countryside in smaller areas, they have always um, visited cities for the culture. Now that is actually um, not easy to, uh, to, re to restore, to recover. It's always a mind shift, but we have seen that many people, for example, in London that were connected to their offices are not anymore um, bound to offices. They actually are free to work from anywhere through, uh, through Internet. And we see a huge um, number of people trying to find houses, affordable houses, in other parts of England. And I expect that that the that will slow down the urbanization process that we have seen over the last decades. Okay. And that will that is probably a result of that mind shift. Yeah, and I think also the the, the call of the citizens. I've been in Shanghai, and they are recovering uh, river borders with a with a surface area which is far bigger than 
well, some of our European national parks. I've been in Abu Dhabi, where they have a lake in the center of Abu Dhabi. They want to have a designated as, as wetlands. So I think really uh, the mayors and the, and, the, and the boards of the of the bigger cities are, are rethinking what, what their identity is and what they can offer their, their citizens. And I agree with Albert that the necessity for this will be very much enhanced by the by the Corona crisis and the, and the fact that people were, were well yearning for some green space to 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 be, and I think it was also in the introduction of Rob earlier uh, in this seminar. So I think we 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 can agree on that. Uh, but uh, having well the ambition to make your city a national park that is another level, and I, I liked it very much in in Daniel's uh, speech. So I think this is a very good topic to think through and food for thought for later. Um, is there anyone from the audience who say, oh, well, I did a chat intervention and I want to, I, I really want the floor to, to have a statement. And I will remind you that this meeting is also meant to challenge you to become one of the founding fathers of a learning network. And uh, well, if you want to come forward for that, we, you're also welcome to, to ask for the floor. So Nina, are there any volunteers you see on your oversight? Uh, no. I don't see you know I don't see any volunteers. We had a lot of people from oh Frank, you want to say something maybe? <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah I, I want I want to give a short reaction because I uh, posted the the, the mind shift. Um, the reason that I uh, posted it is that we are uh, looking for space. Netherlands is a small country. Uh, we need one million more houses. Uh, we need more green area uh, in our cities. And we strongly believe that people who are living in cities and villages uh, have to be uh, connected with nature. But um, we have to discuss also uh, how are we uh, planning our nature and landscape uh, to uh, improve not only the connection, but also for housing the people. Uh, so maybe I really think that our landscape and nature has to be a little bit become a little bit more urban. That's that's why I uh, posted that mind shift. Yes, and I think the whole experiment of this uh, land park Assisi is also well. Is this urban with a with a built a, a percentage of this land park, or it is it green, or it is a mix, and is this mix acceptable? Uh, these are I think the kind of discussions. It's are very challenging and interesting and. Uh, I think we'll have not seen the end of it uh, yet, at least not in the Netherlands. So thank you, thank you very much, Frank. I think this is the one of the points on, on the agenda for the time to come. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, my personal uh, uh, feeling is about about finance mechanisms. They were not much on the table, and um, well, though I like the the, the Vulcan Eiffel uh, very much, it's um, for for well uh, health equity. We, we also have to reach the people with uh, no work or have with very small incomes. And um, this means that our health finance system should allow people not to take drugs for a medicine, but to take a walk for a medicine. And so the, the finance mechanism has not been on the table much. We cannot solve it yet. It was not on the program, but I think this is also my, my idea that it should be on the agenda, perhaps something for my final speech when I close the meeting. So I think if we uh, if we have no further items from Nina or something to to address, then I can uh, I think go to the next item of our agenda and um, have uh, the keynote speech from uh, the provincial minister of North Brabant. I welcomed her earlier this afternoon, Elise Lemkes. Uh, I think very important for uh, uh, well supporter of the whole uh, triennale for the approach of uh, amongst others nature for health. So. Thank you for being with us, Alice, and uh, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, uh, André. Uh, first of all, I would like to compliment and thank the organization for this very interesting program of the Seminar Green and Healthy Destinations and for working on the network. And the network, as well as nature, is in the heart of our lives, I think. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, well, health and nature are throughout our history are linked. The well-to-do of yesteryear had estates outside the city to retreat to a healthy natural environment. The Romans used hot springs to build spas, places to regain health and to recuperate. Um, they are really 
part of our heritage, the landscapes. Nature, our landscape, they are essential for our well-being. They have been rediscovered in the past year. Woods, the nature reserves, have attracted more visitors than ever before. Whether walking, cycling, or simply enjoying the great outdoors, nature and the landscape have a healing capacity and are essential to all of us. The provincial government of Brabant strives that all Brabanders, the people who are living in Brabant, have access to nature and enjoy its benefits and healing properties. We want to move towards new forms of care and a society that contributes to the quality of life. Innovation plays an important role. At the heart of our health policy framework is positive health, or so to say, a meaningful life. We want the Brabanders to feel healthy, to feel good, to have faith in the future, to enjoy life, to be in contact with other people, and to be able to take care of themselves. Health is influenced by genes, behavior, living environment, and facilities. Except for the genes, in which we evidently have no influence at all, we take up different roles in the other three domains, especially on the cutting edge of living environment and behavior. In that respect, our health policy is built on two pillars, from norm to constantly improving and from healthcare to prevention. Our focus in the first pillar is on is is on, um, is on permanently improving the quality of air and on healthy cities. In the second pillar, our focus is on prevention, helping, pe helping people to lead a he healthy life. The main health benefits are found at the front door of the health care system, not in the hospitals. We are ambitious. ambitious. The aim is to add three healthy years to the lives of every Brabander by 2030. Allow me to highlight three topics of our health policy framework, topics in which nature and landscape play a pivotal role. First of all, behavior. Exercise contributes to positive health, not only physically, but also mentally. Brabant, many uh, nature reserves and parks have much to offer, close to home. Take the Van Gogh National Park, where you, where you, can, you can literally walk in the footprints of Vincent. The nature gates are points of entry where you can find information and inspiration. We remove obstacles to enable everyone to walk, cycle, or otherwise to, to their heart's content. Vincent van Gogh was lyrical about the landscape in Brabant. He was inspired by it and learned us to really observe it and appreciate it. And not only the nature as such, but also the people working in the fields, the farmers. Food is at the base of our health and healthy food is widely produced in Brabant. We encourage farmers to produce food in the healthiest possible way, contributing at the same time to an environment with clean water, clean air and a healthy soil, which is at the heart of the craftsmanship and entrepreneurship of the farmer. We stimulate building new business models for farmers, help to create the conditions to be able to earn a fair income by farming more nature inclusive and really rewarding the role of the farmer as the caretaker for the landscape, building an attractive, accessible and biodiverse landscape. Farmers play also an important role in offering care facilities, for example, for children and elderly people and offering food in a short chain directly to the consumer in farmer's shop. The Vincent van Gogh Park offers the ideal environment and conditions to be a living lab, which is already proven in the projects on healthy soil and the biodiversity monitor. In combining nature, leisure, health, care and art in the unique landscape of the van Gogh National Park, we build on a green and healthy business model for the region. Secondly, I want to uh, tell you something about healthy living environment in our framework. Brabant must be a nice, safe and healthy province to live, work and recreate. Clean air is a basic condition for this. We have already significantly improved air quality, even when comply with European standards. Not all health risks are eliminated. The aim is not only to achieve European limit values, but above all, to focus on health benefits. Benefits. 
Clean air and a healthy landscape with an abundant biodiversity is what we want. Also, green in the cities is important in relation to both climate adaptation and the health of the inhabitants. We stimulate the connection between cities and the countryside around it. The Vincent van Gogh Park offers the ideal combination of cities with green landscapes around the corner. In fact, the cities are part of the landscape in the Vincent van Gogh Park. Thirdly, the healthy facilities. Excellent facilities let people benefit maximally from the healing effect of the landscape. Van Gogh National Park is a healing landscape, testing ground of international allure. Van Gogh National Park could be a green destination and linked to the effect of a beautiful landscape on the health of people. With this in mind, we create facilities for the inhabitants, but also for the tourists. To achieve this, we make the positive health effects of the Van Gogh National Park known. We stimulate local actions promoting sustainable development and practical pilots. We do this with many partners. Combining knowledge and experience give, gives strength. We do not limit ourselves to Brabant. In fact, we are looking beyond our borders. The experiences gained in the London National Park City and Gesundland Vulkan Eiffel are in, inspirational. We sincerely want to connect and share knowledge and experience in a practical European network of green, healthy regions. To conclude, we must cherish the landscape that takes such good care of us. That also requires us to take good care of nature and landscape. Brabant's nature is under considerable pressure in terms of declining biodiversity and groundwater levels. The quality of the soil is also a concern. We must guarantee the healing properties of the landscape and nature. As provincial government, we are committed to restoring biodiversity, to strengthening and re revitalizing our nature. And that requires something from, a, from a, all of us. Whether we are a farmer, a nature manager, a large industrialist, a vegetable gardener or a hiker, we can all contribute. If we take care of nature, nature can continue to take care of us. That's an evident truth for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I think it's a very uh, courageous speech and uh, taking full responsibility for the scope of, of this topic, being a front runner, being innovative, which is, I think, uh, something which is in the Brabant genes, but uh, has now its 21st century uh, component. And... Um, breaking all these barriers or, or, or gates, as uh, Rob uh, told uh, earlier this afternoon, is what you do and what you, what you show us. So uh, we are very happy uh, with Nature for Health to be in your province and in this beautiful experimental park. So congratulations with your speech and uh, the work so far. And I think Thank the Triennale the tri is also kind of a, 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 a big party to, to celebrate these inspiring things. And uh, well, in these weird Corona times, we also need these things to celebrate. So, uh, congratulations also with that in initiative. I think a very Thank worthy you, uh, concluding speech from uh, from our host here in Brabant um, leaves me for some conclusions and and recommendations to to finalize this uh, this I think wonderful seminar. For me, it was. Uh, it, it was energy giving and this is also I think what what nature and health is is about when, when your cell phone is empty you don't put it to bed and say have a good night because the battery will not fill you have to energize it and and I think this is what nature also does it energizes you it gives you new vitality and I think this is also what the countryside what our what our what our provinces need a vital vibrant community where where we are not losing species and losing jobs, but we are adding new nature, new jobs, new uh, initiatives and new, uh, new, new entrepreneurs. And uh, I think this is fascinating to be in this time frame. I think post-corona will give us a, a fantastic window of opportunity. I see a provincial authority who is willing to step into that. I see a lot of inspiring uh, uh, examples this afternoon. I think uh, from from well, the, the, the landscape of my youth, where I went with my parents for camping uh, towards London as a, as a city park uh, ambition and all kinds of in-between green and healthy destinations. I think 
all the elements for a good and 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 new productive networks are there. So I I hope and I expect that people here together this afternoon will will take up this challenge and and form this learning network to bring our efforts even further and faster. And I think uh, that will be done because I feel it is possible. And I hear a lot of stories this afternoon of people grabbing this chance. I also welcome the fact that this very uh, young people early, uh, like the interns we see on our organizations, young women and, and, and men who are willing to, to inspire us, but also an old mayor who is now chairman of, of Van Gogh and, um, and of the Triennale and all ages in between. So intergenerational, I think this was a very wonderful afternoon. And um, I think I can close with, uh, with uh, saying that uh, I hope it will be worth for you. We will give you back uh, the, the, the takes of this afternoon. So if you want to dig deeper in, in cases, sheets from Amaland, which you, we could not see all, if you want to dig deeper in uh, some of the challenges you saw, the examples, how, how it was done in Vulcan Eiffel, you can also find it in the material. It will be on the websites, at least of uh, Nature for Health and Green Destinations. And perhaps Van Gogh and the province will accommodate it also. So I thank the organizers and, and uh, the organizers committee to make this possible. I think it was a worthy event in the whole triennial uh, endeavor. And having said that, I close the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Andre. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.